Bags and Boards podcast number 53. Comic Familia, we appreciate you. Comic Tom here with a Golden Age specialist, Overstreet Price Guide Advisor. His name is Jeff Itkin. How you feeling, brother? Dude, feeling good. It's 2022, first time in the booth, and uh, I'm enjoying this fresh start. Hit the like and slap the subscribe button. We have a giveaway on deck. Congratulations to the winner of the last podcast giveaway. We have a fun podcast for you today. We're going to be talking some spec books. You brought some comics. I brought some funny books, some expensive paper. We're also going to be chatting about a record original art sale. What's sold, Jeff? An interior page that we have to discuss in greater detail. Do you want to get into it now? No, no, we're going to save that one. They got to stay tuned because we also are submitting not 10,000, not 50,000, over $100,000 worth of a collectible comic book. Hulk 181. First appearance. <laughs> That's right. First, oh, are you saying first appearance? Well, you got you to gotta specify here. Is it first full appearance? What are you saying? No, no, no. We don't have to go down that path. Is that sorry, We're going down this I path? I don't know, Jeff. You're the one who said it. Oh, God. What do you think? We have Hulk 181s. We have Wolverine making his debut from Canada, Canada. Yeah, it's his first appearance. All right, we have the first appearance going to CGC, going to Florida. Stay tuned for that. Let's actually start the show off, though, with some show and tell. Amazing comic books came in. They didn't get damaged upon shipment. Bravo, USPS and UPS. There's a little bit of FedEx on this table as well. I have some books. You have some books. First, you have a Golden Age book with an elephant with blood dripping down its mouth. Explain. Yeah, this is um, an extremely rare book. And it's, for those who know, because it's so rarely traded, it's the bloodthirsty elephant cover. He's got red eyes. He's got blood coming out of his mouth. He's charging at these two, what appears to be hunters. And um, it showed up, and I had to get it. There's only been two recorded sales on GPA of this book, and they were in like 2009, 2010. I think there's only eight on the census of this book. This is when CBCS, because the person who graded sends this stuff to CBCS, which is fine. But he felt that he needed to glue, for some reason, a tiny corner um, of a spine split and then attached the floating piece in that corner as well. So he got a conserve 3.0, which is fine because it's fully um, reversible. And I got the book for a discount because he went and did that. It's a 3.0 conserve CBCS graded copy from 1939 DC Adventure Comics number 34. And this is definitely old, expensive paper at its best. We have some what appears to be I don't know, probably from the sun, like some f a faded cover to a degree. It's also rippled a little bit. Are you thinking you're going to try to grade bump this? Um, I don't know. I don't. I, I, after looking at other copies, it doesn't seem faded. It is what that cover is. The cover is detached, and that's why it looks like a seven five eight zero. So it's cleanly detached. Like when you look at it, it looks like it is attached, but it's such a clean separation um, that it's just coming off. It's detached. So not much you can do about it. But there is a chance with some books, and I don't know if this is one of them or not. I'm going to have to have it reviewed. I know I can remove the conservation, and there is a possibility of reattaching that cover to the staples. Now, if that happens, this book may get a 5.5 five blue, and that's, that's a big deal for this book already. What would you estimate that value if that were to come it's so tough because this book doesn't come up for sale very often. Um, we have a Jerry Siegel story. We also have work done by Bob Kane on the interior. And what's awesome about this book and seeing those two names on there first, who are those two individuals? Jerry Siegel helped create Superman and Bob Kane was the main artist for Batman for a very long time. Um, there is conversations that, you know, there might've been some other help than Bob Kane creating Batman, like uh, a lot, a lot. Yeah, like Jerry Robinson, who didn't get as much credit. Bill Finger. Bill Finger. So this right here, given that it's 1939, this is like pre-mass superhero. Yeah, we don't see uh, superheroes kick in in there until issue 40 with Sandman. So this was new adventure comics from 12 to 31. Then it became adventure comics from 32 on. And so this is a kind of a pre-hero issue in the golden age. Okay, so you're getting to price. Yeah, I'm sorry. So price, I would say... It's 
it's one of those private sale books you just kind of pass around. I'm already going to rehome it to somebody I know who's been looking for that book for a very, very long time. But if I can get to that 5-5, five, five, I can see it being an $8,000 plus dollar book. $8,000, comic fam. There's something to be said about strange animal covers and golden age collectors. I've met a handful of them who legit, all they want is that particular animal on the cover, an octopus, a tiger, an elephant. You know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, octopus covers, I'm a huge fan. Uh, people love gorilla covers. Uh, you have the whole jungle runs. You have jungle uh, comics. You got jumbo comics. They're all just set in a jungle type atmosphere. So people really love their animal covers. Thanks for bringing this one on the show today. I have a very easy book to show off here because these all came in the same week. When I spec, I spec hard. I try to go after the books that I am thinking have some potential. And I like to do it all at once because if the market's right for one, it's likely right for the variants and other books. It's modern books, but I do have a stack of Scott Snyder's Witches Number One. He teamed up with Jock to make this amazing horror narrative, and it's disturbing. It's got body horror, some major themes, major subjects. Not for everyone. I have given this book lent it multiple times. I have many copies of the graphic novel and someone who is a fan of horror either loves it or it's a little too much. That's why I have a affiliation for this because it causes a strong feeling that lasts with its readers and hearing that there is option potential with this book. It may not happen for some time. I saw prices of cover A of Witches one hit right around 150 at its peak. If you wait on auction now, you can get them for right around 80. So I tried to scoop them up around 100 and basically said, you know what? If I'm patient, I could pay a little bit less, but I may not be able to get them all at once. So I just went in, paid a little bit more than what like auction sales go for and bought a bunch of these for near 100, 115, 120 bucks. If you type in witches on eBay, you can see these sales. So first one, which wasn't on the lower end of that scale, it's because it's a CBCS 9.8 signed by Scott Snyder. I figured, why not? It's the only one that was really affordable on eBay. I think I grabbed that for under 200 bucks. I also have here a Witches number one, Midtown Comics. This is a exclusive and it's done by Sean Murphy. And it's just a gorgeous cover. Something that I'll do is look at a modern run and Bring up all of the variants specifically on a app like Key Collector where you can see them all on one page. And I kind of judge them based off each other and scarcity. When they're all affordable, it really starts to become about your own personal taste and what you think could pop. It's a total gamble, but this variant was affordable and stood up kind of above some of the others. So I said, why not? It, it looks cool. I like the lighting. Obviously, I had to get a couple copies of just the standard cover A, and that's this one right here. Take a look at that cover. Jock is so good, man. He is. That's actually a really cool cover. The first one you gave me, let me check this one This out. one's just cover oh. A. What are you looking at? It's a very simple cover. It looks like it's a wood scene. Very much feels like uh, Blair Witch in a weird way, mm -hmm. like a child in the woods, and all you, it's kind of washed out in color, right? It's very light blue and uh, blacks, but then a very striking red dripping from a tree to just show that it's bleeding. So when I tell you that that's where individuals go to die in this comic, inside a tree, it should intrigue you enough to then look at that cover again and go, oh, this is horrific what I'm looking at here. Um, um, so you're basically watching a death on the cover. Pretty powerful. Issue number one had a ghost variant cover. This one goes for near the same amount as cover A. Another trippy looking, just disturbing cover. Okay, first off, uh, a tree is where people go to. Uh, peop the trees are people? No. No, they're it's, witch it's called witches. Witches. So they go to this forest to die. You got to read the book. I'm going to have Jeff read the book, Comic Fam. And if you've read Witches or Witches, as Nick from Key Collector Comics calls it, because it's spelled with a Y, um, comment down below. Let me know what you think about this. Maybe I'll get Jeff to read it. You're not big on horror. I, I, you used to be. Yeah, I used to be. I like horror. I do. You had kids, though, right? That's the, I've heard that in the community a few times. Like, I used to love horror, but now I have kids. Everything's a little different to look at. Weird. Right? It's a, it's a strange thing that happens. So... 
other thing that I don't typically do is by issue twos. If I'm going to spec on a book, I'm going for cover A and looking for variants, scarce prints of that book, maybe a signed book, a cover A. I bought an issue two, the Phantom Variant exclusive, just because after all the books you've seen, how dark they are, how much surrealism is on these covers, I saw this one and it stood it just it kind of separated itself from the pack. It's more vibrant. It's an issue two exclusive. I felt like, why not? It's affordable and it, it's just different enough that I think if the show does happen, all these books will be fair game. But the ones that look different from the others, those are the ones that could go way further. Yeah, it's a cool cover, man. You kind of got this looming tree of death over this character. So it seems to tie in with what you're telling me story-wise. And I love the color scheme. It's a little uh, more vibrant than the, than the rest because you have like the green and yellow. But again, it's all about the trees and being vulnerable because that's what the comic book makes you feel like. It's a family comic book, to be honest. It's all about loving your kids and, and protecting them. All kind of tree hugging stuff? Or? That's right, man. Yeah. Basically, just mm -hmm. a little bit more <laughs> disturbing. Okay, you got one more book, Jeff. We're not going to uh, stop talking until you show this other kind of within the horror theme type of book, but it's crime, right? Yeah, I mean, I love crime. Crime for the Golden Age is a great way for you to enter into Golden Age because it's, it's super reasonable, all right? And there's so much of it and great, great covers and pretty good stories on the interior. So this is uh, Underworld Crime number seven. It's really a classic crime cover with kind of a horror feel appeal because you have this girl... Looks like bound by gangsters with this hot poker at her face. And you can obviously tell she's about to be tortured or in terror. Um, this is a 5.0. Uh, what, what is it? Off-White Pages? Off-White Pages covered by Bill Woolfolk. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous 5.0. Beautiful 5.0. And this book apparently just had a really, really strong sale. I just saw that on an IG post yesterday. So I need to look it up real quick. Look that up here because I'll tell them about this cover. It actually says on the CGC label, bondage and torture cover. Interesting thing that I've had to express and explain to individuals who are not part of the community per se, but they know that comic collecting is a thing, is that there are so many subcategories of collectors and some specifically go after things that seem super demented, almost wrong to own. And there's an appeal to owning these types of books. And there's a lot of different reasons people enjoy owning these scarce collectibles. And I think it's because it's so wild that it exists. And during the time that it was being produced was largely marketed to youth that it becomes a collectible now that people seek to find in the community, but they're so rare because so many were destroyed and barely last. Cause this is from 1953 that that's why it holds such, you know, height in the marketplace. Yeah, I mean, we just had the sales, so I finally took a look at it. And a 5.0 just went for 7200 which is, I believe, almost double from what it was before. And it's no surprise, that book has sat and slept. And I've had it for a little bit. I was pleased to really get finally a copy. But I am not surprised that it finally hit that seven plus thousand dollar mark. It deserves it. It's a great, great book for that time frame of comics, for the atomic age. It's the last issue of the run. Gangsters literally holding the damsel in distress by the hair. It is astounding that it exists. Well, it's just a beautiful artwork, too. It isn't just, you know, you'll see some cool covers from that time frame. But sometimes the artwork's a little sloppy, but it's still, you know, appreciated to an extent. Um, there's so much drama and horror in this cover that um, you can't not love it by just looking at it. Hit the like, slap the subscribe button. We're doing a giveaway today. We have someone is grilling the chicken number one. Only 100 copies were made, and this was actually released by Wrath of Comics. Thanks for sending this in so a lucky member can win it by commenting on the video. I want to remind the community that if you want to listen to us, you just don't have the time to watch the whole video because we go kind of long. You can find us on SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. We had a crazy sale that took place. Not our sale, but in the comic community. I'm kind of speaking for us all because when something like this happens, it's, it's a moment. We all talk about it as if we knew the person. And sometimes 
it's kind of like, you know, hey, I know a person that knows a person that knows the person. Like, that happens a lot. I personally have no idea because this is a threshold of monies that is so extravagant that it had me stunned. The most expensive piece of original comic artwork sold this week, and it's the same title. Well, kind of the same title, same superhero, specifically Spider-Man, that holds the title of most expensive comic book sale that happened in the last year and in comic history, as well as original art piece. Yeah, so you're comparing the AF-15. Amazing F- Fantasy 15, the first appearance of Peter Parker, Spider-Man. And that sold in a 9.6 last year for 3600000 Yep. Okay. And we're comparing that to an interior piece of artwork, what was done by Mike Zeck. Correct. Of uh, the reveal of the black costume on Spider-Man, I guess. In Secret Wars number eight. Which sold for, what, 3.36 so, I mean... Million dollars, Jeff. That's yes. a lot of green. Yeah, let me rephrase that. Almost $3.4 million. Wow. That's a lot of dinero. And first off, I wanted to preface this conversation with what we're really dealing with. Because I personally, and I want to hear your thoughts about it, what's your gut reaction to that? Because I think that's too much money. Yeah, that's that's such an obnoxious number for this interior page i get there's historical whatevers but honestly there's historical covers all the freaking time and they don't get anywhere near this number so i don't quite understand how this ever achieved it yes i get you know people were bidding whatever but if it becomes one of those investment group situations where it just falls into investment group and they just wanted it to add to their portfolio Man, I'd find a new investment group because that's just stupid waste of money. For 3.36 or 3.4 million, just to make it easier, you know how many other black suit Spidey interior by McFarlane's I could have purchased? That's exactly where my mind went. And that's why I wanted to preface this conversation with what we're actually dealing with. Spider Man dons the black suit within, I mean, it was like seven months eight months prior to Secret Wars 8 in the Amazing Spider-Man run in issue 252. And just weeks later, so soon in like real time back in the day that two other issues came out featuring him in the black suit that many believe all three of these comic books to be tied. You have Marvel Team Up 141 and Spectacular Spider-Man issue number 90 with the cool black cat cover. Secret Wars 8 would come out near year end that same year and we would find out how he got it. But in ASM 252, he just comes back and he's wearing it. You'd figure that out later in the year how he got it, but it's because of comic books. So there's a huge amount of time where he's been in the black suit long before the origin tale is told. And the origin tale is the page that just broke those records. I don't value that page as much as I think the investors probably did. Yeah, I mean, let's just say it wasn't investors. Let's just say it hit. I'd be surprised if it wasn't. I would be surprised too. I'd be sur- like, let's just assume it was two people going at it, okay? Who really find this to hit a soft spot in their heart from their childhood. Is that potentially possible? Sure. Is it more possible that maybe some investment groups got involved who don't know what the heck they're really doing and just trying to put their money in absolute top tier pieces of artwork and comics? That's probably more likely. I just think they overpriced. They overdid it on this and like grossly overdid. I mean, most people thought that if this piece hit a million dollars, that would be an unbelievable feat. So to go to 3.4 million, it's just, it doesn't make sense. Now, listen, I know a lot of these people. I know the auction houses. Um, I don't know who bought this piece. I know who bought the action one in that same auction that same day. Give them some perspective. From what I understand. An action one, was it a 6-0? It was a 6-0 white page. It was called the Rocket Copy, which was recently discovered. It's got a little rocket stamp, which I really did enjoy. It was kind of a nice addition to the book. For some reason, it added to it. And that sold for, I believe, 3.18. I think somewhere around there, almost 3.2. We just had an 8.5 sell last year. For 3.25, I believe. So whoever bought that A5 just had a huge comeuppance. But that makes sense to me. And that's justifiable. You know, you get it. The action one started off comic books, basically. First appearance of Superman. Right. Superhero, really. Yeah, and started off the Golden Age, which then spun into every other age we have now, guys. So he 
pretty much brought comics to us. Very important book. So what I was saying is like, listen, there's been discussions of like, you know, potential shill bidding here and there, but I can't imagine that's the case here. You know, I mean, there's been discussions of that, but that's a lot of money, you know, to to have run away a long time ago. So it just feels like we probably had people who were just bidding against each other who really wanted this piece. And will it cause other pieces to go up in value in a black suit? I don't think so. I don't think this levels the playing field for all the others. I call this such a massive anomaly that it's so far off basis that I can't imagine it actually affects the others. And if it does, not not to that extent. Yeah, I think it would be very important information if there were investors such as Heritage involved. We know that that information, that's information has been public, that they've been investing in certain video games that broke records that made its rounds in mainstream media. So there is a level of interest I have in that for that exact reason. You know, is this an actual art dealer? Is this a business? It's fine if it is a business, you know, investors get together, they pull their money together, but is it at the, uh, is it with a goal that's beyond what that one item can do for an investor and more about the industry, such as the art, original art market. Cause you're right. I don't think black suit spideys are going to be affected as much as just the art market in general, be looked at again as, Oh, this may be the opportunity now to bring more to the mic. Let's actually have some dealers who have been holding on to things such as this original page. I believe this was a, was owned by the person who acquired it a long time ago. They've been holding this piece for, for a bit, probably took some motivation to, to, to bring this out in this market right now. And that is something that I would be concerned about, you know, is, yeah. is it artificial to a degree? Is there a bigger purpose for bringing this to market than just a standard action one would be? Yeah. You never want to see like some corrupt manipulation, which I don't really think. Alleged. That's, yeah. Alleged. Which I, I don't think that's necessarily the case here at all. So I don't want to throw anything under the bus, um, which we're not doing. I have no reason to yeah. beyond what has already been public. You can do a Google search comic fam. Yeah. I'm just mentioning, I'm just mentioning and addressing it because these are comments I get on my Instagram. These are comments we get on the YouTube, uh, about this type of stuff and it's out there, you know, so let's just address it now. I don't feel that's the case. Will this bring attention, um, to, to art? Probably. I literally had, um, a family friend of mine call me. Okay, he does um, construction work and only works with like uh, excavators. Okay, big machines, as blue blue collar as it goes, knows nothing about comic books. Call me today to let me know that he saw some sale of some art piece on the way here driving. So it it does it does affect it and bring attention to the market. And yes, it'll probably help in some degree. I just don't think it's going to spike McFarlane black suit Spideys to the million dollar plus markers now that just it doesn't make sense this just doesn't make sense in so many fashions and um so that's why it's hard to wrap your mind around it right because like we don't understand this dollar amount so for us it's different like it's hard for us to wrap around it but if i had money that had to be spent for an investment and this was what was chosen by multiple people yeah maybe you just keep going and going because that's what you do. You plant your money in something that's going to give you more interest than just having it sit in the bank with nothing. So have your money work for you. So that's maybe that's the mindset here. And it's just hard to relate. So it's hard to wrap our minds around it. Comic fam, I have to hear your thoughts in the comment section below. What do you think about this original piece of artwork that just sold for over $3 million? Don't forget, it'll enter you to win a giveaway. And we told you it was coming. Jeff, I've known about this collection that you've had of one particular comic book for quite a long time. It was one of the first, you know, things, yeah, you know, we, we, we start building a friendship. You don't always show every single person what, what books you have in your home or wherever you keep them, you know, you, you, you kind of keep that reserved, but you get to know people you want to share, you know, and I wanted to know what kind of stuff you had. You're the golden age guru. And one of the first things you showed off was your collection of Hulk 181s. I want to chat about with that with you today I want to introduce the comic fam to this collection you've been building, give them some ideas about why, how long, how much, because you're going to be grading all these copies. What do you got? 
All right, so look, I'm the Golden Age guru, and I love Golden Age, but my second favorite time frame is the Bronze Age. Which is so interesting. You skip the silver. I mean, we all love some good silver, but what about the Bronze Age do you like so much? I just love the creativity. Um, I love the artwork. I just feel like it's more relatable um, and just to digest in reading. But yeah, mostly the creativity of the new characters and, and the artwork. I just liked it more than Silver Age. Silver Age is great, too. But Bronze Age for me is just a lot more fun to collect and I enjoy it more. So it's like the grittiness, you know, the power, the the particular characters were more raw in the Bronze Age because these writers were given way more creative freedom, you know, utilizing horror themes and and mystery themes and then creating such um, you know, like going against the grain type of superhero, specifically Logan, which is what we're looking at. Yeah, so I have twenty two Hulk ones here. Okay, and I think I have a 23rd somewhere, but we got 22 here. It was an interesting time going to that short box when you pulled it out, and I'm like, oh, what am I looking at? What collection is this? You're like, oh, that's just my Wolverine books. And they're all the same books. Yeah, <laughs> we don't even talk about the 180s. Uh, we'll get into Hit that. Hit the subscribe button, time. Comic Fam. That's coming for another, uh, another day. You know, I started really diving back into comics in like 05, 06, and really just hit the ground running with like slinging dollar books, buying collections on Craigslist. And uh, eventually I just started, you know, coming across books. And I was at this point in my life where I had a job and money and I had 100% faith in Hulk 181 and Wolverine. Okay. This started back then? This started back then, probably really around 07, 08. Somewhere around then I really started to um, acquire as many of these as possible because they were, obviously they were a lot less than they are now. Sure. And I was trying to buy any copy I could, uh, $400 or less. Okay. And I was going on Craigslist, reaching out to P or eBay, I'm sorry, and reaching out to people and always trying to hustle as much as possible. And it was easier back then. Okay. But I remember constantly getting grief from people. Like, what are you doing? Why do you keep putting more of these in? Why you got to sell them, sell them, sell them, sell them. It's like, no. Okay. I don't want to sell them for years and years. It's to this day. Still, people are always just like, you know, Hey, you got to sell them. You got to, you got to get out now, get out now. I get asked quite a bit if I can ask the guru if he has a Hulk 181 or knows someone who has one that maybe they can hook up a deal on. And I always tell him the same thing. No. <laughs> Cause I yeah. know what you're going to say. You're going to I'd buy it if I, if I can get one, like you're just been a constant acquisition. Yeah. I was at the point where it's like, why am I even selling these? You know, I was like, I, I've sold a bunch. Too I've seen you younger. sell a few, but it's a long time I always, ago. But what would you do with that? You'd always try to find more. I remember getting like a, a seven, five, possible eight O with upgrade. Mm -hmm. And it was like a $600 book. And I felt weird about it. Like I had multiple dealers walking around and they're like, no, no, it's like maybe a little bit less here, maybe a little bit more here. Like they were all helping this person selling it at the time. Cause it, cause none of the dealers cared. They're like, oh yeah, this kid wants it. Cause at the time I wasn't like willing to, like, I was actually more like PC collecting, right? Like private collect, uh, personal collecting. And they were like, ah, oh, let the customer have it. And they were trying to help the seller figure out how much to charge because he was actually, you know, he didn't know what he had. So we were all making sure that he was, you know, we were doing this right. But this book wasn't expensive within many of our community's own lifetime. Yeah, I mean, the book is not what it was now. I mean, it was still a very popular, it was still a Bronze Age key. It was the Bronze Age key, but Bronze Age has expanded mm -hmm. and, you know, has the whole hobby has. And I mean, again, shout out to Ron Murray, okay, Friend of the podcast, friend in person in real life, great guy. Um, had a case of Hulk 181s, and these are talk. We're talking nine six nine eights, guys, and he sold them for four hundred dollars a pop for a right? long time. Too. And that was a that was a strong number at the he time. He would just bring them, them, just raw. Yeah, he would just he brought them. So, um, just give you an idea where the books came from. Then, I mean, my goal was to have a long box once of these. All right, and quickly that changed because prices changed really quick. And then it short box. Really, really quick. Yeah. And so I don't think I've bought a Hulk 181 in probably four or five years now. I mean, most of these I've had since 2010, 11. I mean, just 12. I don't know. Somewhere around there. I've had them for a very long time. Um, haven't found many in collections either. But again, I've been hunting mostly Golden Age. And a lot of people know what they have with Hulk 181s these days anyway. So, um, but if I ever get one that makes sense, I'll keep it, but not any more with this stack. I'm not sure what I'm going to do, guys. I have some, some plans for uh, an addition. So these books might all finally be going, which is a hard move for me and decision to make, but it feels right because it's for the right thing in my life. So we're going to grade 22 
Hulk 21s. There's a couple that have already been graded, three of them, but we're going to crack those out and upgrade upgrade them because I think they're all upgradable by half a point potentially. Hulk 181 has absolutely gone up in value. It's also gone up in interest as you would expect. The thing that I find surprising is the amount a collector will tolerate as it pertains to grade on this Bronze Age key. Because there was a point when if you got hit with a copy that was missing that Marvel value stamp, it literally would be looked at as a key book that would be comparable to other key books that we value at as like $100 right now. Yeah, it was very difficult to move incomplete books because that value stamp basically made the book incomplete. And th- which is funny that you mentioned that because I... That was the last Hulk when anyone ever bought. These all have Marvel value stamps except for one. And that was the last Hulk when anyone I bought maybe three years ago. Again, shout out to Silver Age Comics out in New York. To Gus. Gussie. I bought it from him. I mean, it's got a piece off the front cover missing and back cover. Yeah, we'll show it here in a second. Yeah, it's got issues um, on it and two clip coupons. But for like 300 bucks, you're like, it's a Hulk 181 regardless. But that gives you some perspective here because... The last time you had an affordable copy presented that you actually pulled the trigger on, you went incomplete because that's all that was left. And I think fast forwarding three years into today's market, which we'll get into some numbers here in a little bit, hit the subscribe button. It shows that some people are just saying, I don't even care now. I just want the damn comic. It's true. It's it's very true. And, you know, I like to buy books with with value on them still. Okay. And some and some books I just have to buy because for Golden Age, you, you have to pay up. Because you'll just never see it again. So that happens. But for stuff with the Bronze Age, you know, and so much that I like and I'm familiar with, I like to buy with value. So I saw that with value. So that's the problem right now with Hulk 81s. You know, everyone's, there's a lot out there, but everyone's pricing them very aggressively. Um, So there's always new highs and new markers. And you're always just catching up. At some point, you just have to commit, okay, and be like, all right. For the two, three years I've been looking for a reasonable copy, the book's gone up 40%, let's say, 35%. So you should have just bought it. At some point, you need to just buckle down on certain books and get them and have faith in the hobby and just get it out of your out of the system, right? And so that's, that's my recommendation from anyone who's trying to get one if you can. Don't get me wrong. They're expensive. But they're always going to be more expensive. I think this is a good example. I mean, obviously not everyone can afford Hulk 181s. I sure as hell can't do that. But I did pull out a bunch of the same issue, yes, variants, yes, issue twos, but of like the same genre of book, you know, earlier in the show, which is, which were all around a hundred bucks, you know, give or take 50 or so. And it is the same type of mindset. If you're going to commit, if you're going to invest, putting it into something at the right time and going all in. It's risky. You know, you always have to do this with with caution. But if you're doing it in a way where you feel confident and if something starts to go the opposite direction, you're willing to wait out the storm or drop it with a little bit of loss because the potential upside is worth it. It doesn't have to be a Hulk 181 that that you do this with. You can sub out any comic book that's sitting here on the table with anything else. And I would understand and applaud and say, oh, wow, that's a a, a risky or an awesome investment. But it's an investment nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, we can say the New Mutants 98. How many times have we seen that book spike, drop, spike again? Okay, I didn't write it out last time. I mean, I couldn't sell that book for $800 in 98. Okay, and this was only just a few years ago, I believe. Dude, within... The last 10 years, I used to go to conventions and tap out of buying or New Mutants 98s because I found them so often and I had a budget and it got to the point where it's like, I'm only going to be able to pick up seven of them right now because I don't want to pay more than $25 because it seems expensive at $25. And I would let other copies go that were high grade, nine six could have been nine eights, but I didn't want to spend another 25 bucks. I got six, seven copies already. Good luck finding anything near that right now. Yeah, exactly. And like that book would sell for twelve, fifteen hundred. I don't even know. Did it, it's hit two thousand, right? Uh, newsstands and Mark Jewelers. I mean, like the book has been up and down. It's currently, I think, at a low a little bit. But dude, at the start of last year, that book went nuts. Yeah. So just remember, guys, a first appearance and a key is still a key. Whether it goes up and down, depending where you buy it, is going to make a difference for you. 
if you can wait it out, and I'm not talking about like second tier and third tier, but we're talking about true key first appearances of true mainstream mainstream characters. That's always going to be the fact of that book. So if things go up and you buy it high, okay, which we've all done, okay, it may drop, but it, it will come back again because the character is either going to be one that stays f- around forever and will have its day again, and you just need to write it out. Now, if you're in the in and out game, yes, I can see that, okay? You're going to have that pressures of making your money ASAP, okay? But let's just say comics don't care about you like that. <laughs> you know, you That's make true. your decisions, you live by them, you have highs, you have lows, and you know, sometimes it works out. And sometimes if it doesn't, you got to hold on to it a little longer or you sell it, take that money immediately and reinvest it and make it up on another book. It's all important information. I think when it comes down to this hobby, anytime I'm hit with a collector's decision to invest, to spec, to anything, collect, there is something to be learned from it. And that's why I want to try to harness on this podcast because you're going through paying a good amount of money, doing things with a lot of books that people dream to own. Some members do own these books and it it gives them some, you know, just different ways to look at the hobby and, and how they're going about it so they can achieve the most success because a lot of the times in order to get to this point, you have to make good decisions with other books and you kind of build to this point where you're getting the bigger books. Yeah. And this, I'm going to expand on what you're saying right now, because that makes sense too. Cause on top of this, look, I was very bullish on comics because I had faith in comics and it's worked out great for me, but I came in at a very good time, right? Right now it's very difficult to acquire what a lot of people have already acquired. And I understand that, you know, I feel very blessed to have gotten in what I did and what I have acquired in time. Plus, I do the hustle, so I'm always able to to really find stuff. But um, for others, again, it's it just seems like it's this amazing or incredible mountain you need to climb. But then you look again, and I would have said the same thing three years ago. Sure. And look, three years later, everything's even more money. Okay, and we're going to look from here again, this point, and it's all going to be even more money. So it's just at some point, if you, you like, we said, like I just jumped in and I, um you'll have to acquire stuff and hope that your hobby continues. And I don't see it getting weak for any reason. And all I see is growth. I don't know about you. How do you feel about it? Oh, I think that we're in for a really good time. Um, I think it growth is inevitable. There will be comics that won't maintain. There's always going to be fluctuation as there has been for the duration of comics history. There's always going to be, ebbs and flows for a lot of books. But I think that the market health long-term looks amazing, especially considering amping up what is being done on screen. I know we all talk about it and it comes out of a lot of people's mouths like, oh, you know, it's got movies all the time and now we have Disney Plus. And, you know, I think the ample amount of conversations that are happening as it pertains to being able to see Hawkeye on screen, you know, seeing Joaquin Torres and, and, and all these awesome characters that a lot of people never thought would happen it ends up kind of diluting what it actually means. This is a a path forward that is going to be part of everyday life where like cartoons used to be, where we had multiple superhero cartoons that were always fresh every day, something new. It's going to be the equivalent on Disney Plus, but not just with cartoons, with every franchise that can keep its fandom happy. And the way you keep the fandom happy is by not just killing people off And then the franchise dies, which is a lot of how spec used to be. It used to be, oh, Bane's going to be in this movie. So we got to drop it right before the movie or decide if you want to keep it if he survives. Right. And then will they continue? Probably not. We probably won't see Bane for another decade minimum. Not anymore. You know, Thanos came and went. But look, we're just watching them on what if these characters are going to be in and out of of our lives as long as we live. There, I don't see fandoms ever really dying for any particular character. Look at Kingpin. No one thought Charlie Cox would reprise his role as Daredevil, really. Everything's fair game now. And with that type of reintroduction of any villain, and by the way, variants of villains, multiverse types of things, anybody could be anyone, we're always going to see mantles pass and we're going to see content from all of these comic books that it's going to make comics themselves, the collectibles, always relevant with an increasing amount of eyes on them with more collectors joining this community by the day. And that's people who are doing the collectible of comics themselves. 
Okay, and honestly, all this TV and uh, movie stuff is building generations to come of interest in heroes that they're grown up with. But we're seeing actual people enjoying digital comics themselves. When I say digital, I mean NFTs. Okay, when you go to a platform like Vivi and you're seeing consistent growth, you're seeing outsiders who truly don't know comics buying this stuff. And I say that because I've spoken to them and they tell me specifically, you're lucky because you know about comics and know what to buy. This is how they can get in on it. Okay, this is how they're able to yes. get into it and what they're comfortable with. They're not comfortable going to a convention, going on eBay, buying a book. They're comfortable with what this app says that they should pick up twice a week or so. Yep. And that's what they're doing and they're investing in. Okay, and I'm looking on Vivi. I'm like, why these particular books? Unless yep. they're just tied to something to happen. Okay, great. But I get what he's saying. I'm looking. I was like, okay, 70% of this stuff I would not buy in, in person. I would put my 30% efforts into these particular books. But what I'm saying is that we're seeing multiple avenues of ways for people to find interest in characters and the comic collectible itself. Absolutely. It, it proves the point that... That right there, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but maybe we can flash back in the, in, in, you know, in the, in the future to this moment, if I call this right. If there is a downturn, if the collectibles market ends up being hit with the effects of a recession or something like that, right? A, a, a damaged economy, whatever, things, things happen. The first place we're going to see it affect are those third-party types of sites, however you want to call them, these, these digital spaces, the NFT market, these kind of things that are not necessarily connected to the in-print comic book collector's market, those will suffer first because those communities, yes, have collectors like you and I are there. However, there's likely even more individuals who are never going to go to a convention that are participating because they want to be part of a comic market that they are unable to join whether it's time restraints, knowledge, or just interest in general. That'll be interesting to see. I mean, you know, we'll have a recession at some point again. It's just yeah. what it is. Welcome to the economy. Um, will that make people lose faith in the American dollar and still keep things in other things like investments, like collectibles? Who knows? But um, we'll remember this conversation and we'll visit it and see. Comic fan, we have to know your thoughts about the comic book collector's market. What do you think about the guru investing in Hulk 181s for quite a long time? Over a decade, it sounds like. We have to know, and it will enter you to win a giveaway, as mentioned. And we have, as we've talked about on the show, a huge stack of Hulk 181s, 22 to be precise. And we are going to chat about a few of them. You know, there's a lot of books here. And the range of grades, based off of what we were quickly going through as we were preparing for the show, some are going to be low grade. Some are going to be incomplete, but there's a couple 9-0 potentials, a couple 8-5 potentials, 7-0, 6 O's. So we're going to document what we expect this to be and also the results in the future. But there's so much information just as the books are in this particular fashion, just bagged and boarded, sitting in front of you. Let's go through some of the outliers, the, the ones that are a little weird and see if we can dissect them a little bit. Hulk 181, first appearance of Wolverine. We got a stack from the 22 to, to talk to you about. And, you know, I want to start with the one with writing on the cover. Specifically the one that we are sending to CGC. Because we are going to be sending one copy of this stack to CBCS, but we will get to that in a moment. So this particular copy of Hulk 181, um, tell me about the grade first, and then we'll get into what's written on it. Because it's not a signature by anyone in the comic book community. Rather, the industry artist writers. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, it was owned by somebody who actually gifted this book to somebody else. Okay. So we'll get to it though. Talk about the grade first. So the grade on this book, and I believe if I remember or recall uh, when we discussed it, um, is going to probably be closer to a five, five, six, oh, I think today's market for six. Oh, and it's interesting because the numbers do trade and change so often it's a minimum five K for this book. And that's what sometimes it sells. It doesn't mean I'm, it gets marketed to that, right? And some of the things that we can look at with this particular example is looking at the spine, looking at the color breaks. This book has a lot of vibrant colors on it, which makes it really exciting to look at, but also really easy to spot mistakes on. And this one indeed has a handful of spine ticks. It has some creases and it also has a bend 
on the cover in the top right corner. But the reason why I pulled this one out in particular amongst the other five, six, seven O potentials is because there is something written in the H, the letter H in the trade dress, right? The Incredible Hulk. It's in the H in Hulk. And it says, Paul Woods to Mark S, my best friend. So this right here is a, is a gift between two homies. What a nice, generous gift. How would you feel if someone just gifted you a Hulk 181? I had, I think Bueller was gifted a Hulk 181 at one point. I, I would be um, absolutely over the moon about it because um, why the hell wouldn't you be? Fast forward a little bit. Oh my gosh. The, the plot thickens <laughs> because something took place between the gifting of this comic book, this funny book, this expensive stack of papers that are bound by staple. Yeah, I'm going to go through what I think happened. What happened? Okay. Because the word best yeah. was crossed out. Oh, my goodness. What happened? All right, someone gifted you a Hulk 181. What could have happened where you said, you know what? Screw it. This guy sucks. This gal sucks. Whoever it was. And you, you had to take that emotion, put it in the tip of that pen, and cross out the word best. You know, judging by the names Paul and Mark and the penmanship being so clean, you know, I'm going to guess this was at some point when this book had value, which from what I understand was pretty quickly from when it came out. But I'm going to guess this was a gift sometime in the 80s, maybe mid 80s, or it had a little bit of value. One friend, young friend gave it to another young friend. And, you know, like I said, they were best friends. Oh, I think I know where you're going with this. Are you going to tell me that because it was in the 80s and the, the Overstreet it's saying different things about the first appearance of Wolverine that this friend gifted this and said this was the first appearance and then he found out about Hulk 180 and said, screw this guy, he lied to me and he crossed out the best? No, oh, <laughs> but okay, I okay, do okay. love that story. And I think at some point, they were no longer friends. And the book was still, I think it happened quickly because instead of realizing that this book gained a lot of value by then, because it wasn't like it had a ton of value still probably, because if it did, why would you write on it more? Right. right. He went back to it. So at some point they weren't friends, but he still had the book enough to still like it. And he's like, not nah, doesn't want to be reminded mm. that they were best friends. And it didn't cross out my best, my friend. He just said best friend. Oh, so, so maybe they actually are on good terms, but he met somebody else and they're like, you know what? You're my new homie. Every day, every day. Yes. Maybe that person got jealous. Oh, there's a new friend is like, wait a minute. I know we have a relationship that we're building. We're both homies. But I see that Hulk 181 and I'm never going to be able to gift you a Hulk 181. So there's this now like imbalance. What a responsibility to be that good to a friend. But no, you can never do what what's the person's name again. Uh, you can never Bill? outdo Paul Woods. You can never do what Paul Woods did. Oh, my goodness. Yep. What yep. a weight to carry. Yeah. And then you can throw in a, 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 a love interest maybe too. <laughs> That's right. right. Oh, a, my goodness. Right. Oh, he's dating my ex now. Oh, so now it's even more complicated. Or my sister. And now he's no longer my friend, my best friend. So, guys, you, you, can write, you can write a movie on this script. That's right. Comic fam. Okay. So this is what's going on with this particular issue of Hulk 181. We had to bring it to you. It's also like low key. I know we're just joking around here, but it's these types of added things to comic books. It's not always as, you know, funny or major or has like some type of story. Sometimes the story is even way cooler than, than what we kind of just, you know, randomly brought up on the mic. Sometimes there's actual some like legit amazing history because of one little initial and what that initial represents, what that, that date stamp represents, the pedigree. For example, I'm kind of curious about opening it just to see if there's anything more on the inside. Oh my gosh. All right. Comment, hit the, the like, cover. slap the subscribe. Um, so Jeff's going to do that. Do it now. Do it now. Let's see. Let's do it now. Let's, Let's do case. it. And pass me that other one here right. while you do that. Um, because this other copy of Hulk 181, let's do this one. Um, Jeff's looking up in the inside of this, this funny one we just discussed, but I am holding a incomplete copy of Hulk 181. This must be the one from New York. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was the one I got from Gussie. So on the back of this, it says two coupons and stamp, two coupons and stamp piece out back cover. So they've been cut out, and dealers sometimes like to write things 
in, you know, like, why say more words when few words do trick, right? That's kind of the, the idea here. So I have a total, oh my goodness, a tattered copy. Like this right here on camera, you can see it, but it's missing the uh, back bottom left corner entirely. It's been not just cut out, it was ripped out. That's probably why Gus didn't write the word cut because that wouldn't like appropriately describe someone like just tearing it out of the book. Oh my goodness. Okay, so not only do we have the value stamp missing, we have um, a piece of the the actual like Power Man ad for the Defenders. That's been cut out. Maybe the the reader at the time was like, I right, gotta give me some Luke Cage. We also have another one um, in the top left corner. That's pretty interesting. It looks like it was something that was written by the writer. I wouldn't normally have this thing graded. Okay, I wouldn't. I keep it as a reader. But since we're already doing this many, might as well add to it at this point. Um, so that's that's why it's going to go with the pile. Uh, back to this, though. I just looked inside, and inside the cover, it says, P.S. I hate you, Dad. What? Comic fam. What <laughs> is going on with this book? So now... I'm just the kidding. Dad's I'm just involved. kidding. Oh, my sad. gosh, dude. I was like, what is going on? Jeff got me there. Oh, you're killing me. Is uh, there anything written on the inside? Or is that no, it? it's a clean copy. Man. Okay, it's a clean copy, comic fam. He got me. He got me. Okay, so we also have... A, oh, and by the way, let's bring it back to the incomplete. What do you expect that one to come back as? Because obviously, green label, incomplete, missing pieces. Point, point, point 0.5, yeah. a 1. With those two big pieces, I would say it's probably a 1.0. I don't think it's going to be as low as a point 0.5, but it's probably a 1.0 incomplete. All right, and that's going to be like a green label. It's going to say coupons missing and, and all that good stuff. So we now have another comic that we have to discuss. I want to chat about the Stan Lee signed comic because of the entire pile of 22, this one will be sent to CBCS. Why? And if you can tell us about the grade on this book and maybe any information that you remember about it. Yeah, I mean, obviously we're sending this to CBCS because they'll authenticate a signature and it'll say signed by Stan Lee. Um, you know, CBC, CGC wouldn't do that. It would just either be a green label because it's on the front cover, or maybe there'll be some quotation marks that say signed by someone or written by, name written by Stan Lee or something like that. But I, I think they actually put on there like the name Stan Lee is written on the cover. Yeah, something like along in those Sharpie, lines. you know, right. as if anyone can do it. Yeah, I mean, I would give this book's grade probably around a three, five. Solid, nice, nice looking book. Just got a couple little issues here and there. I think it's cool that he, that Stan um, did his signature actually on the trade dress because anywhere else it would take away from this cover. I don't mind the trade dress having letters written over it, especially from Stan the Man. I think it's a really cool collectible. Yeah, and, and it has the little um, ticket uh, on the back oh, too. Stanley autograph pass. There it is. It says, redeem this pass for one autograph from Stanley during his Saturday and Sunday appearance. So cool. Mm-hmm. Wow. I like that. I'll Someone waited just, in line to get this done. Yeah, I'll probably just keep that. I mean, there's no point submitting it with it. So just keep this with, with myself and send the book away. Yeah, CGC, they have a program where they will do signature graded books, but they have to witness it. It's a CGC witness program. Um, signature guarantee because they saw it happen and they there's no questioning about that where CBCS will go through a third party. I believe it's a third party. I don't think it's actually in house, but it's like one of the top, if not the top signature authentication companies. And they do it to a percentage. Don't quote me on it, but it's no, there's, it's impossible to be 100%, but it's to such a high percentage that it's industry standard. Yeah. I don't know the uh, entire ins and outs about it, but they definitely have a system um, in place. Uh, a couple other books here in this pile I really want to address are, uh, Two Mark Jewelers. Dude, you have two Hulk 181s with a Mark Jeweler ad on the inside. One is graded even already. So let's actually take it that direction first. So let's talk about the graded books in general. So you have one graded Mark Jeweler, and that was a 6.0. And then what are the other graded copies that you have? Because I think you mentioned you're going to crack all these and try to get the grade bump. Yeah, and then I have an additional 6.0 as well here and an 8.5. Um, the 8.5, they all seem to have um, imperfections that can be improved upon. So there is a chance for at least a half a point bump on some of these. I'm hoping the 8.5, I can get to a 9.0. Uh, that price point um, escalates quickly. 
And that 6-0, I think I can get both these 6-0s maybe up half a point as well. These books, the Mark Jewelers, when I got them, there was no real price difference between a regular and a Mark Jewelers. People didn't care always about the Mark Jewelers. I always found it to be that little extra something special because it just separates itself. So um, I was just, I'm glad to have them. I mean, even in 6-0s, they, they don't seem to trade hands that often. Yeah, Russ the Comic Sensei, Mill Geek Comics, he's the one who I kind of credit introducing me to the value of these types of collectibles, it was never sold to me as this is for sure worth more. It was always high grade is going to be way easier to sell because to the right buyer, they're looking for that. However, they're not traditionally more valuable, but keep your Whitman's look for your Mark jewelers and we'll joke about newsstands being worth more, but it was never really part of a deal we ever did together where it's like, Hey, I'm selling you newsstands. So now there has to be a inflation, like no, 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 or price hike rather. Um, but Mark jewelers, indeed, there have been a growing amount of collectors who have been hunting for Mark jewelers for quite a long time, seeking these out well before the rest of the pack. And I'll tell you, looking at a book from a the above angle like this and seeing that line down the spine. Cause that's how you can tell you have a Mark jewelers. I can see a blue ad because it's two pieces of like thick paper different than the actual comic book paper and it's folded. So that's what gives it that extra thickness. And you can see it from afar. This book is thicker than a standard Hulk 181. And when you see that, especially in a key, it gives you a level of an excitement when you've dealt with them in the past to know, oh, you got something special, like under 5% of the run. And the fact that it even exists is a thing, that it's complete is a whole other thing, and that it was a key, hot damn. Oh man, this Raw 1 of Fortune is a lower grade. I would say it's probably, the name Sherry's written on it. Sherry, I have an Aunt Sherry. Does anyone have an Aunt Sherry? Because I I know a handful of people with an Aunt Sherry. How, How does she spell it? S with an S. Yeah, this is a C H E R I. Different name. So it's probably a different person, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we do have some numbers that we looked up on Mark Jewelers. They come up so sparingly that it's really tough to gauge the amount of value it adds having the ad. But when we looked up prior years of random grades, it seemed like it added upwards of $1,000 in the same grade compared to like the last time one sold. And with the market being what it is now, I could imagine it being a markup of over $1,000 in a mid-grade tier. I am sure as you go higher in grade, it becomes a higher multiplier too. I mean, if I see this in a 9-2, okay, I, I'm assuming that a Mark Jewelers 9-2 is more than just $1,000. Absolutely. So I could see it being multiples, um, maybe putting a 20% on across the board possibly mm-hmm. um, would probably maybe be a little more accurate, but it's hard to tell. And I look for more Mark Jewelers. I find those to be more of interest to me than a regular one. one. So I'm sure many other people do as well. Butch in the house, he loves Mark Jewelers too. And it's a, it's a easy thing to add to the Hunt comic fam because I just described what I was looking at. You can see it from overhead. If you're hunting at a convention, if you're looking in lawn boxes, you have the time, take the extra second to give a overhead scan, an optical pat down, if you would, and see if you spot any colored lines on any of the comics, because you may pull out a common book that has a Mark Jeweler, but if it's in high enough grade, that 20% could be 30 or 40%. Absolutely. 110%. There we go. (laughs) (laughs) We're talking percentages, comic fam. Hit the like, slap the subscribe. Do we have anything else in the stack that we got to talk about? Uh, Let me take a quick look here, man. Uh, Oh, by the way, the grade on this is probably going to be about a 3-0. 3-0. There we go. All right. Outside of just having this rougher copy with a big spine split. Yeah, you have a copy here, and it looks like the center of the comic was split all the way to about half the comic book length. Yeah, I have a little notes on tape here. It says a 1.8, a centerfold loose, spine split, cover tear, two of them, piece out back cover, page five. That is a whole <laughs> lot of information, yeah. Let's take a look at this sucker. Hey, I bet you can't wait to get your graders notes because they be free now over at CGC. So excited. There we go. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. Is that more than one page that yeah, is that is look. cut? It looks like there's more than, oh, wow. Yeah, okay, Confam, it's not just the cover. It's like the first five or six pages. 
So, somebody thought about ripping this up, and they said, nah. It's like someone saw someone split a, a phone book, but then they realized, you know what? <laughs> I can't do it. It's too hard. This and, is- and when I say a person, I mean like a toddler, because it is a comic book. Yeah, I mean, it looks like the tear is the biggest thing. Something about page five. Oh, maybe yeah. it's five pages in. Oh, five pages worth. I was yeah. close. I said six. Yeah, that's, that's still wrong. It's five. <laughs> it's, it's at five. Okay. Um, uh, approximate estimator is my superhero name now. Um, <laughs> Approximator. <laughs> I, I, can, I can get you pretty damn close, but not quite there. Okay, so comic fam, let me know what you think about this. Hulk win 81, 22 copies. We told you a little bit about some. I'm excited to see what the results are because they're coming back. And we got to tell you about where we're sending them. So hit the like, slap the subscribe, and let's chat about pricing the grading cost. Because for real comic fam, as Jeff was tallying up approximate value, because we want to give you some estimates of how much it's going to cost him to grade all of these copies, he actually said, maybe I don't want to do this video. He started to flake out. He started to have some regrets. Yeah, I was thinking after I totaled this up, Okay. Why don't we tell about and, some totals too? Yeah, and that was with our discount for dealer discount, okay? And we three gives us 15%, all right? I believe it's 15%. It may be lower, who knows? Like, whatever lower. it is. Yes. I could have gotten another Hulk 181 <laughs> for that dollar amount. It's going to cost you about the price of a lower grade Hulk 181 to get all these graded. Just how much, we're going to get to it. But let's talk value here because... We went through, you did some approximate grading and we did some averages. You're going to come back on the mic and give us your guesstimate of what you think these should grade for so we can compare to what they actually come back as. And I want to give the comic fans some tips on how you're going to be shipping these out because they're not going to be in one order. It's going to alleviate some cost. It'll probably help other members of the community who are grading comics in mass. And let's chat about the approximate value per grades that we estimated. The full value of this, is what you're asking? Yeah, full value amongst what grades, approximately? Yeah, so the grades are going to spend. Obviously, we just looked at a bunch of these books. We have them potentially as high as a 9.0. Maybe if I get lucky, better. I'm going to press every one that I believe needs it. I have to crack out three books here. You're not having CGC press any of these? I'm not having CGC press any of these. Or CBCS, because one of these are going to CBCS. And Right, one of them is going to CBCS. Um, The turnaround times are far too long um, for CCS. To do that, and I am a fairly good presser, and I don't feel like there's anything here that I cannot handle. So mm. I'll press it myself. Confidence, comic fam, hit the like button. <laughs> you like that confidence, hit that like. Um, so I'll, I'll take care of all that, and we'll submit them. And I think a conservative value here. I mean, I think it easily hits 100 grand. Could it be 125k? Potentially, yes. So I'm excited. We'll take photos of every one of these books, and hopefully, we can match them up when they're in their holder. And uh, see how we did. So, a hundred to one hundred and twenty-five thousand. Let's estimate on the conservative side, say a hundred thousand. There are only a couple routes you can go to grade this type of uh, worth in a collectible through CGC. You can't just do the cheapest tier and wait nine months or whatever it is. Yeah, there was the walkthrough option or the express option. Now, express, I believe, was only up to three thousand dollar value. Okay, so some of these I will probably send there because it came out to $110 a submission uh, for us. And it was close to half. It was probably like eight of the books or so are probably going to be right around the three to 4K. Yeah, there'll be some that are definitely around that price point. Then it escalates quickly because right away we start jumping into 5000 to possibly $12,500 for some And nine books. oh at this point. Yeah, that would be market a price for those books, which is, I believe it's like 2.7% of market is what they charge, I believe, or about 3% with a minimum of $125. That's right. So that, that's the difference between this. One is you pay f- per book. And then when you escalate up to that extra value, because it's above that 3K, it's a flat fee or whatever's higher, the uh, percentage of the total value, which was two point. I think it's two seven or 3%, somewhere around there. I think it's two seven. There. I think okay. it was two seven. Um, so we just tried walk through on all of them. Yes. Okay. We put a total. We're like, okay, this is about the value on average. It's like the most you can spend essentially with with the average. Exactly. And that came to 30, 
400 bucks, give or take? About $3,400. Yes, expensive to grade that many Hulk 181s. So, but here's the thing. As you just mentioned, there's an alternative tier for the lower grade copies, the ones that are going to be right around that $3,000 marker. So that should alleviate our estimates upwards of $1,000. So it's going to cost about two to $3,000 to get all this done. Yeah, and we'll get it back in reasonable times. I mean, Express is, you know, it's it's still quick. Um, walkthrough is obviously much faster, but to save, you know, that type of dollar amount, it's just worth it waiting another two weeks, I guess, for the books. Uh, so I'll probably end up doing that. I was hopeful to just do it all at once. And maybe I'll get a, you know, wild hair and do that anyway. But I probably want to save the money because I can maybe put it towards another book. Cause it's so funny because prior to today and us putting these prices in to figure out the, you know, how much the cost was, you know, expected cost was going to be. You were joking about picking up some more copies of Hulk 181 just to make the numbers sound a little better. But you didn't. No. <laughs> well, because like a full submission sheet is 25, right? Right. So I, th I have 23. I only have 22 here. I, I couldn't find the 23rd somewhere. And Must be nice just missing a Hulk 181 somewhere. Yeah. No, it sucks. Because <laughs> I know it. I feel like it's somewhere. Um, but... I didn't want to buy another two more, and I'm glad I didn't because I'm going to probably separate this order anyway. So that would have been a waste of, you know, capital just to spice up this video. I think it's spicy enough. I think it's spicy enough, especially when I tell the community they have to hit that subscribe button, like the video. Liking the video is like doing a, a small prayer to Thor for Jeff, you know. Whenever I get a tag on IG you know, over on YouTube, hey, I'm grading these. I always tell the person, yo, I'll do a small prayer to Thor for you, you know. Let, let, let's use some Mjolnir power, right, to, to just put those, those grades to the best of their ability when they go into that slab. So hit the like button. It'll send some good comic vibes, some karma to Jeff as these go on their expedition to Florida on the other side of the country. I know this isn't the only book you spec on, brother. And I know you have a growing amount of Hulk 180s that we're going to have to do the same thing for, I'm suspecting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, it's not going to be nearly like this, but I did pick up a fair share of 180s back in the day, too. I may be able to get in on this one because that one seems to be a bit more affordable, including 183, which I have been buying a handful of copies of as well. Oh, what's wrong with 182? Oh, excuse me. 182 is what I meant to say. <laughs> I meant to say 182. <laughs> I mix it up because it's because no one cares about it. <laughs> uh, and they should. They should. It's a great book. Okay. So start caring because caring equals collecting. Comic fam, we want to know your thoughts about all this in the comment section below. Don't forget to check our audio only versions if you prefer to consume it in that way. It'll answer you in a video if you comment. And this was podcast number 53. Amazing. We appreciate your time today, comic fam. As always geek responsibly enough said comic fam this whole podcast was sponsored by the best new app to buy and sell collectibles whatnot available for both androids and iphones link in the description to follow both myself and the golden age guru you're going on there on tuesdays now and i know wednesday you're joining us for whatnot wednesday absolutely man um follow me on ig and whatnot and um and get ready to buy some books for a dollar starting auction. That last 60 seconds long, I saw your recent collection pickup. It was insane. Come join us over on the app. And we also have two other videos for you to check out. Enjoy them. We made them for you. <laughs>